Shalom, everyone. Shalom. All right. It's all about love, Israeli love. So um, it's my esteemed honor. We had uh, Willa here at our clinical informatics uh, presentation last year, and she has graced us again this year by um, coming back. And for those of you that don't know, um, she is faculty at San Diego State University since 2006 and a professor in the School of Nursing. Uh, Willa has a much diverse background in clinical nursing, education, research, performance improvement, management, and information services. Her research area has been in the exploration of practices and tools to improve patient safety and the provision of care specific investigations which she's actually presented to us in the past have been um, looking at computer provider order entry on medication safety and nurses and nurses attitudes knowledge skills and practice and actually their barriers to evidence-based practice prior to this uh, faculty position willa was the vice president of patient care systems in the information server department at sharp Healthcare in San Diego, where she had the responsibility for patient computer systems, including implementation of their new core clinical system and physician order entry. And then on top of that, she has also been published widely in the literature for, and she has also received her doctorate in nursing science from the University of San Diego, has her master's in nursing from San Diego State and is currently serving as our esteemed chair on the HIMSS Board of Directors. Thank you, Willa. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> if only my parents were here. <laughs> well, thank you very much for inviting me to come back again. What I'm going to talk about this afternoon, and I'm aware that I'm the only thing between you and the traffic that is awaiting you, so I will try to make this informative and entertaining. As a little bit of background, HIMSS was invited by the Israeli government, I believe it was the Ministry of Health, um, invited HIMSS to bring a delegation to Israel for them to promote health information technology and all of the wonderful things that they're doing. I was privileged to be able to join that trip as chair of the board. And so there were a group of nine of us that went on a whirlwind tour of Israel. And this presentation is actually authored by not only myself, but Lemby Sarman, who is a colleague of mine at San Diego State, who joined me on the trip. And so I like to include her name on these slides. So a little bit of background. Now, one of the pieces of background is not only am I Jewish, but I was born in 1947, which makes me one year older than Israel. So, so if any of you in this room are Jewish and about my age, you remember Israeli Independence Day. You knew that Israel was five years old, 13 years old, 20 years old. I mean, I've tracked with Israel all, literally all my life. And I have to tell you, I don't know anything about Israel. I was overwhelmed when I went there. One of the first slides that they showed us was the slide that's up on the screen here. This is to scale. Now, I knew I know the shape of Israel. I know it's on the Mediterranean Sea, and I know it's surrounded by countries that don't like it. I've heard that my entire life. What I didn't realize was how small Israel is. This map is drawn to scale, and Israel is about the size of New Jersey, maybe a little bit smaller. So it's really tiny. And to understand healthcare and health IT in Israel, it's important to understand its size. And so I'm going to start out with this talk with just some general information about Israel and to compare Israel to the United States. Because one of my takeaways by going on this delegation was that we, as people living in the United States, need to learn what's going on in other countries. It's a humbling experience and we have a lot to learn. So this is a UN map. I, um, when you get the slides, if you're interested in the geography, you can um, get this from the internet. These are some things to point out. This beige part is Israel. In 1967, there was a war in Israel, and Israel occupies land that had been under the control of, other, of the Arab nations. 
Now, I never understood what was meant by occupied until I went there. You see, the United Nations has never recognized that these lands that were won through combat are part of Israel. So it's called occupied lands. And there's three areas. The Gaza Strip, which we hear about all the time, which is adjacent to Egypt. Right here, this big white area is the West Bank, which we hear about all the time. The little blue dots are Israeli sediment, settlements, and the red dots are Palestinian settlements. This land right here, this is, yeah, the arrow shows. This land here was part of Jordan. Not sure what happened here. It was part of Jordan and is now is occupied by Israel. So when you hear in the news, will Netanyahu continue the Israeli settlements or not? Is he's been very aggressive with that. What does that all mean? As an American, I can tell you that I have a totally different view about it, and I'm probably more confused than I was before I went. But nonetheless, this area had been Jordan. It now is occupied by Israel. And then up here, we have the Golan Heights. The other thing that is of interest, so the major cities, there's Tel Aviv right in the middle, and the other major city is Haifa, which I'm having here, right here, right? Haifa is in the north. Now in Haifa is the international world headquarters of the Baha'i or Baha'i religion. Now those of us in Southern California, especially San Diego, there's a Baha'i um, temple in Encinitas. Now, they have beautiful gardens. So I'm in Haifa, in northern Israel, and we can, literally, we can see Lebanon and Syria. During various wars, the hospital we visited in Haifa was shelled. How many of you go to work worrying about whether or not you will be shelled by an enemy nation? You know, it kind of puts a different perspective on life. So why did Israel invite us? Well, as we all know, Israel is a Jewish state surrounded by Muslim countries, Arab states, which have been enemies for, as best I can tell, eight to 10,000 years, <laughs> just to put it in perspective. So anything made in Israel can their market share, their marketplace is the country of Israel, Europe, Russia, North America, South America. They cannot sell to their neighboring countries because the neighboring countries will not buy the products. So they invite delegations from other parts of the world to come see their health care, see the products they develop with the idea of increasing their marketplace. So we were there to view the healthcare technology in Israel with the idea that they would be making business relationships. So that's kind of the background of why did they even invite us to go there. So when I was in Israel, we started about 7, 7.30 in the morning with an incredible spread of a buffet of breakfast with olives and cheese and you know I can go on and on about the food. Um, we had breakfast, and then we went to hospitals, telemedicine clinics, software companies, sightseeing. We'd have meals interspersed at times, and we went to maybe 8 or 10 o'clock at night from Monday morning until Friday evening. So I, it was a whirlwind of a tour, and I was overwhelmed with information that I had difficulty organizing, which is the genesis of these slides. I was trying to put it all in perspective. So this particular slide I thought was interesting. From a religious perspective, Israel is the opposite of the United States. So we're familiar with the United States and probably we could ask in this room would come up with similar percentages of what's on the um, right hand side of the slide. We're a little under 2% Jewish, less than a percent Muslim, we're predominantly three quarters of the population in the United States is some version of Christianity, and about 16% are unaffiliated. We, uh, we're an aging population. Our average age is around 37 years old, and two thirds of us are under Medicare, you know, 15 to 64. Contrasted with Israel, which has 8 million people. So in the world, it's the 97th most populated country where the United States is the third. So we're dealing with a whole different 
set of just how big is it or how small is it. When it comes to the religion background, and this has a huge cultural impact, it's 75% Jewish and 17% Muslim. So there are Muslim slash Arab Israelis who are Israeli citizens, just like there are Jewish people who are Israeli citizens. Christianity, which is the majority of the religions in the United States, the majority of the holidays we celebrate, it's only 2% of the population. This is a place where Jesus lived and only 2% of the population is Christian. And they have a very low percent of unaffiliated. They're younger than we are. And you can see that from the numbers. So I thought that helped me kind of put things in perspective. But what about health care? Somebody asked me at lunch, you know, but how does their health care compare to our health care? Well, the World Health Organization had done a study where on various measures they ranked the health systems throughout the world, and Israel ranked 28, and the United States ranked 38 on the same measures. Okay? What about health care expenditures? Israel ranked 19. The United States, I'm here to tell you, ranks number one in the world. We spend approximately $8,000 per person per year providing health care. The next number are the European nations that spend around $4,000, and Israel spends about $2,200. So they spend one-fourth the amount of money we spend to be 10 countries above us in the rankings. And then look at the infant mortality. They're 25th, we're 50th. When you look at life expectancy, they're ninth and we're 40th. I thought, oh, we might have something to learn here. So what can I get from healthcare and health IT in, health IT in Israel? What I learned was that it's hard to separate the history and the religion, the constant threat of war, the innovation that the people come up with within the arts. They're, they're all intertwined, as you'll see with the slides that I'm about to show you. This was the view from my hotel room. Every morning, I woke up and opened the blinds. The weather's like Southern California. It was in the 70s. It was sunny. It was dry. It was fabulous. That's the Mediterranean Sea. And this building right here, or this area, that's called Old Jaffa. I don't know if you remember your Bible stories, but Jaffa is where Jonah got on the boat and was later swallowed by the whale. So did Jonah exist? Was that story exactly as we were all taught it? I don't really know. But I bet you there was a guy who got on a boat that was different from the other people in the boat. What I knew is I was looking at a mound of land that has been populated by human beings for probably 6,000, 8,000 8, years. Overwhelming. So the history goes way back and it's intertwined with the religion. Wars. I went to this website and I was amazed. There has been a major war in Israel just about every 10 years is an American born and raised in the United States. I may have some inkling of terrorism. I really don't understand war in my day-to-day -day life. Three days after um, the United Nations deemed Israel as an independent nation, war broke out. Now, that war was not the first war between the Israelites or the Jewish people and the surrounding Arab nations. It's been going on, as I learned, that whoever occupied that particular piece of land for the since the beginning of civilization, wars have happened. You know, the Romans came in and killed everybody who was there, and then somebody else came in and killed all the Romans. And then the people who got killed first, some of them escaped, they came back and they killed everybody. You know, it's just, everybody kills everybody. This has been going on since the beginning of time. This affects health care and affects the need for health IT. I thought it was, <laughs> as you'll see, as you'll see when I show you these things. Innovation. Israel has the highest per capita of engineers in the world. In the world. They have more startup companies per capita than any other country in the world. So they have this young, bright, 
creative population who's generating innovative health IT applications that's looking for a marketplace. Oh, well, then the arts. What's the arts have to do with it? So Alana Gore is a sculpturer who has a muse her home, which is partially a museum in Old Jaffa. So we have the history, the religion, the arts. Um, she happened to be home when we were there and talked to us about her artwork. This was a particular sculpture that she had on one of her balconies that I found intriguing. This young man is a burned warrior coming home from war. So the arts has health care, have health care in it. A burned warrior needs to be cared for. This is part of their day-to-day -day life. Then we went to this man's house, Avner Mariah. Both Alana Gore and Avner Mariah have their artwork in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. I mean, these are world famous artists that just happened to be home when we were in their neighborhood. And we had an excellent tour guide who knocked on their doors. Um, our tour guide lived in Avner's neighborhood. Avner told us a story about his wife and her illness with leukemia and how that affected him through her illness and ultimate death. And his way of trying to deal with this is he's illustrating the Bible and illustrating various religious works. He said, I'm not a religious man. He doesn't observe religion, but he's a very spiritual person. And sort of the interesting thing about him, there's this picture down here, and someone in Israel donated his book to the Pope. And just as a little aside, I thought was a, an interesting story. When Avner went to the Vatican to give the Pope, to present the Pope the book, he said the Pope opened up the book to that page and went, wow. So now when I say wow, that is a papal proclamation. <laughs> so what about health care in Israel? Israel as a country we all know has been around since the beginning of time. Um, as, this, as a country named Israel, it was granted its independence in 1948, but some of, the more mod some of the modern things actually occurred in Israel before 1948. Their most recent national health insurance law was 1995, they revamped it, and there is compulsory HMO coverage. So the country has four HMOs. As a citizen within the state of Israel, you are required to identify one of these four HMOs to receive your basic and essential services. Those basic and essential services are paid for by the government through taxes. So like many states that have universal health care, the taxes are fairly high, but every, every single person, whether you're Jewish, Muslim, Christian, or other, you will receive basic and essential health care services paid for through tax dollars through one of four HMOs. Now, if you have the means or the desire or both, and you want more than basic and essential health care services, you are welcome to do that, and that's where the HMOs compete with each other. So they compete on the services that they provide. 80% of the population actually purchases supplemental health insurance. It may be through their employer, through privately, but everybody gets the safety net, basic services, and then you choose your HMO based on, um, similar to the United States, their marketing. The other interesting thing is there are government hospitals and there are private hospitals. The private HMOs have their private hospitals. There are no, you'll notice on this slide, it does not say military hospitals. So they have every young person does serve in the military. And many of them do get injured because of the frequency of war in Israel. They, are, they have physicians in the military, but when a soldier is injured, they are transferred to a civilian hospital, government or private, depending where they are. So the hospitals are the trauma centers, not only for the car accidents and you know the garden variety things that we see in this country, they are also the um, 
hospital where the injured soldiers are um, sent to. And if you did any of the reading about the Boston Marathon bombings, many of the ER physicians in the hospitals that cared for the um, injured from the Boston Marathon had been, uh, were trained in Israel. They were Israeli physicians used to dealing with this type of trauma. Also, they have no VA system. When you're in the military, you have your health care paid for through the military. When you're discharged from the military, you are an Israeli citizen and you choose from one of four HMOs. So it's a totally different type of system than we have here. So the hospitals. Rambam Healthcare is a government hospital in Haifa that has been shelled during the wars because of its proximity to Lebanon and Syria. And so it's not that far. Shells can reach it. As a little side note, my husband was not very happy that I went to Israel because of things that could happen. That's a footprint of it right on the Mediterranean Sea, a large organization. Um, it's a level one trauma center. Um, Size-wise, um, it has a lot of beds, you know, 1,000 beds coming from Southern California. We don't have too many hospitals that have 1,000 beds. This is not the largest hospital in Israel. The thing that's interesting, they have over 500 research projects annually. Very innovative country. What was most fascinating about Rambam, oh, just a couple observations. When you go into a hospital, it is fenced. And there are security guards, not with these little guns tucked in their holster. I had said they were machine guns. I was later corrected. They're only rifles, you know, but they're big. You go into the hospital, you are checked. You go through a metal detector and your belongings get checked. They are constructing a 2,000 bed underground emergency hospital that will be able to withstand conventional biologic and chemical attacks. So it's a thousand bed hospital that in the time of war expands because it needs to be able to care for the residents and the soldiers that will be um, transferred there. And you can see some of the milestones. This looks almost like any hospital in the United States when you look at some of their contributions. They'll say they were first to do something. Um, and with all that research going on, they do have Nobel laureates on their staff. So that was one hospital, looks like any hospital in the United States, you know, modern, um, using informatics, going through some of the growing pains all of us are going through. Khalid is um, the largest HMO in Israel. It was the first medical group, and you can see it started in 1911 when it was Palestine and it was being settled. There needed to be a way to provide health care to the people who were living there. The thing I found fascinating when I went to the Khalid website was it says that they are there to ensure the health of its citizens in times of war and in times of peace. I went, whoa, you look at our mission statements to improve the health of those we serve, you know, some variation thereof or, you know, research education and, you know, improve outcomes. On their website, not only was war there, but war came ahead of peace. I thought, this is different. This is really different. I am not in Kansas any longer. A little other interesting. It's again a large campus. Here's where the arts, they, they view that art is very important. They had this magnificent art gallery in the main lobby area where there were just, I don't have a slide up here, but just the, what looked to me like hundreds of people walking up and down the aisles with these magnificent masters of artwork, um, beautiful reproductions framed. Every floor of the hospital had a theme of art, and I really liked the floor that had the clowns, and I guess it's kind of interesting because we're in a children's hospital right now. These, it's beautiful original artwork hanging on the walls as a calming effect on the patient population. Outside, it's hard to see here, but there's beautiful sculptures, and then there's this maze where these are just hospital employees sitting down having lunch. Now, this particular hospital is built on the grounds of what was a kibbutz, a, um, a community agricultural or an agricultural community. 
And the only thing left of the kibbutz is this water tower. And they hung some things in the middle, and it's a, a relic, an artifact of Israel's history. There are very few kibbutzes left in Israel. Rabin Medical Center, that was what we were just looking at the pictures of. It's a little bit larger. It's a 1,300-bed hospital. It has 9,000 annual births. I'm from San Diego, work for Sharp Healthcare, where we're pretty proud that we're the largest women's hospital in the state of California with 8,000 births. You know, they've got 9,000. So it's a pretty busy place. Do you have a bomb shelter in your hospital? It doubles as a day spa during peacetime. And you can see the walls. You get this. This is one of the walls. It's a little thicker than ordinary walls. And the ceilings are a little bit lower. But you can go down there and get your herbal essence and massage and listen to nice, pretty music. But should a shell come, it will quickly be converted to an acute care hospital. The other thing is all of our hospitals have uh, chapels. These chapels are these two by four rooms tucked away somewhere where someone may find it to go for some peace and quiet, correct? You know, at least any hospital I've ever worked in in the United States, there's always the chapel, non-denominational. I mean, we want to be politically correct. Now, remember that the Jewish population in Israel is comparable in numbers to the Christian population in the United States. But it is a Jewish state. So there's, you know, they have cultural and political issues that we don't have here. They had a huge functioning Orthodox synagogue. These stairs that you see that are so pretty, those are the stairs to the balcony where the women sit. Because in Orthodox Judaism, the men and the women are separate. So they have a synagogue that has services three times a day. We happen to go by the synagogue during the midday prayers. And you can see there's um, a man on a cell phone and the dark clothing that I think may be a visitor or um, there's somebody in a lab coat, which I'm assuming is a hospital employee or physician. People take a break during their day, and it was a fully functioning synagogue, very different from the United States, in a hospital. So that's that inner, the interweaving of the history, the religion, the arts, um, the wars. So what about healthcare technology? I don't have as, they don't use the web as much because this work was done after I got home. I did some uh, searches on places where I had been. We went to the telemedicine center at Sheba, or telemedicine center at Sheba Medical Center in Tel Aviv. What it is, is this phenomenal nurse managed chronic disease research project and telemedicine clinic. At the time we were there in January, there were about 2,600 patients that were enrolled in their care. And you can see that screen up in the corner. What it was is nurses sat at a, um, the cubicle with a large flat screen um, monitor that had a view of the patient. So it had the patient's medical record. And when, if I were the nurse, having this patient visit, I could see the patient because the patient's at home with a monitor and the patient can see the nurse. This is a way that they deal with the rural population or the disabled that aren't able to come in for a clinic. I know my husband just had, um, he had a heart, uh, a cardiac cath on Wednesday and had a stent put, or on Tuesday, had a stent put in place. He was feeling some chest pain on Wednesday. So what did we have to do? I had to drive the 25 minutes to get, fortunately, it was during the week, during business hours, so we could go to the doctor's office instead of going to the ER, but I had to take 25 minutes, drive him down to see his doctor who took an EKG, who said that it probably is GI because I don't see anything in your heart, I think you're fine, and then we went home. Well, if he had been a patient of the telemedicine center at Sheba, he could have contacted a clinician and gone through the same thing. And you'll sh I'll show another thing with the telecommunicating uh, for the EKG. 
but they have nurse case managers, and you can see they guide patients and relatives. It's face-to-face. -face. It's just that it's face-to-face -face on a computer screen. Well, would that work in the United States? Would the United States population go for something like that? And the answer is yes. I don't think the United States nurses and physicians would go for something like this. This is a study that was done by Deloitte Center for Health Solutions. Now, it's a consulting firm, so you have to look at the results with a little bit of skepticism. But the point is, it, the, it's interest in innovative health information technologies. So what you're seeing on the bars, the light blue are ratings of 8 to 10 being positive. So the scale they were asked on a scale of 1 to 10. The light blue is 8 to 10, and then the bar, uh, when you add on the dark blue, the two of them, it's ratings of 6 to 10. So video conferencing for follow-up calls. 67% of American adults that were surveyed would be interested. And I can tell you on Wednesday, I would have loved the video conference call. Self-monitoring device to check condition and send information to doctor electronically. 62%. The public, by and large, is ready for this. Video conferencing for sick visits. Video conferencing for sick visits. That makes a lot of sense. When you're sick, do you really want to go into the see your clinician? I don't think so. You're sick. And um, this is on the Duluth website. You know, uh, this morning, apps that remind you to take your medicine, 40%. You know, still people were interested in this. So the United States is ready. How many of you in your organizations offer telemedicine? Okay, we got two, three. Good, good. It should be all of us. The technology's there. So here's another piece of technology. This is our delegation. <laughs> I will not tell you which one of these in the Motley crew is me. So RFID technology has been around. This is an Israeli company that um, manages, tracks, manages, and analyzes surgical instruments. I know there are, there's at least one hospital in San Diego that actually uses this particular um, product. But what they do is with RFID, they're able to scan the instruments both to build the trays, which really cuts down the time because you're not counting, and it scans the instruments if they come out so that when the procedure's over, they can tell as long as a human scanned it whether or not anything is missing. And if you um, are questioning it, they have this wand that goes over the body and it'll pick up any, anything that has the RFID tag on it. So if you get RFID sponges um, and instruments, you know, something that um, I certainly have seen this happening in the United States, it'll probably become more commonplace. A company with mobile 12 lead EKGs. These are hospital quality or, you know, office quality 12 lead EKGs. It's not a little stick them here and there and you have really just a rhythm strip. It's a full EKG. It's this little gadget you strap on and it sends the tracing to a smartphone which can then send it to, um, to your clinician. Now this particular com company actually has a call center with physicians and nurses who were there, what happens is the HMOs subscribe their patients to get this gadget for 60 days, 90 days, six months post-acute MI. They have been able to decrease unplanned readmissions. Now, in Israel, they do not have never events. They're, in fact, they think we're nuts with pay per performance and penalizing people for complications. Is a quick aside, the way they do their per member per month calculation, it's a formula based on the amount of resources that it's estimated the patient will consume. And that's to incentivize the HMOs to enroll sicker people. So they, they will work harder if they have a sicker population, but they also make more money. It's based on their age, their comorbidities, where they live. Um, that's how they're paid. They are not penalized for unplanned readmissions within 30 days of hospital discharge. But they're interested in improving the health, and so the HMOs pay 
for patients to have this service so that post-MI, the patient goes home, feels a little chest pain, they strap on this gadget, they push the button, it goes to the call center, they talk to the person at the call center who asks them a few questions, they don't see any EKG changes. I mean, I would have loved it had my husband had this. It would have saved the hour that we spent commuting to go back and forth to the doctor to find out that it was GI. And so they have been able to decrease the unplanned readmissions for further workup because they have a high quality EKG that's, been, that's able to be sent remotely. We have some of these, but I bet you that if you're using these remote 12 lead EKGs, it may be coming from a company in Israel. Many of their products um, are actually embedded in some of our products, you know, like GE, Cerner, et cetera, have their products in their systems. I have to show this one. I knew I was not in the United States. The picture on the right-hand side, left-hand side, that is, his last name is Lapeer. They have a part, they, we were there during the elections. That is that man's political advertisement. I took that picture off a bus stop. Can you imagine somebody in the United States getting elected who has as his political poster? He wanted to become the finance minister. And so his political ad is a number two pencil. <laughs> and he actually, his, co his, his party did come in second. Um, that's Netanyahu on, um, over there. And then that's what Lapeer really looks like. And he is now the finance minister. We are not in the United States. So it was fascinating just trying to put together the religion, the history, the arts, um, the wars, you know, the cultural differences that went on. The thing that knocked me off my socks, now anybody who was at lunch with me can't answer this. Anybody want to guess what the biggest surprise was? Okay, it's late in the day. The food the Mediterranean diet. First of all, the shopping. The picture in the upper left-hand corner, I was told is the best halva in Israel. And I was raised on halva. It's a sticky sesame honey sweet that if you weren't raised on it, you'd think this is really disgusting. That was fabulous. It was fabulous. This is what halva, I guess, is supposed to taste like. The, the quantity, these are in open air markets, just huge vats of everything, fascinating. And then the eating of it, I didn't gain any weight while I was there, but let me tell you, I, we ate and ate and ate. They have these little plates. So you sit down to eat a meal and it's a lot of little plates of these absolutely delicious foods. Our first lunch, there, we sat down at the table and we had all these little plates and we we're taking bits and pieces of everything and it was really good. So we had seconds of everything. Oh, this is a really great lunch. And then they brought us the soup. And we thought, oh, we are in big trouble because after the soup came the entree. <laughs> and so we learned to be more careful. But the food, what you hear about the Mediterranean diet, you see, they're far from a lot of places, too. And so all the food is fresh. It's the tomatoes, the olives, the cheese. It's everything that comes locally. It is organic, I'm sure. So just to wrap, is there any questions about the health IT? We could take a little bit of a break right now just about health care and health IT. Any questions on that? Yes. Um, they. They do not have a personal health record program at this point. They are pretty much where we are in implementing the electronic health record. Um, where they, what I saw that was more, um, I'd say more advanced from my observation, would be on the gadgets, you know, the, the startups. So that they have, um, I met with this one person who had the smartphone app to be able to read the pills, you know, the RFID, um, their analytics, um, the biggest company in Israel with the analytics is actually in some of our big systems here in the United States. So they, they've got the analytics nailed. Um, where they are working, toward, where they are where we are is actually implement, meaningful use, you know, in getting the patients engaged.
Yeah, good question. Yeah. In that regard, too, do they have like a national identifier for the patients? Is I think that's what you would that, try it's a non-issue. Yeah. Yes, they have a national patient identifier. So, if the, but then does does the medical record transfer? But not really because they're not really on EMR. They don't have they. to worry about the medical record transferring because it's it's at there. When you sign up for the HMO, all of your care is organized through that HMO. So, it, it but I guess be, if I had, like, let's say I had labs done in Tel Aviv and then I went up to whatever, the other hospital up north, do, do my labs transfer with me? Well, because it would all be within the same HMO. You see, the HMO, it's a small country, so the HMO covers the whole country. Think of Kaiser. It's four Kaiser models. You get to choose which Kaiser you want but to go But if I get a windfall and then I switch HMOs, does it go with me? I don't know that answer. <laughs> <laughs> that I don't know. I can't answer that. Thank you. Any other questions? So let me just, since it was, I had, um, as a little bit of background, although I grew up knowing I was one year older than Israel, um, it was never on my top list of places to go. Um, I, I have to admit that there were other places, I mean, I, I'm fairly well-traveled, and Israel is not one of the places that was very high on my list, although given the opportunity, I jumped at it, and now that I've been there, I'm thrilled because there aren't many places, there's no place in the world that have some of the things there. Old Jaffa is being restored and was just gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. And people live there. I mean, can you imagine living in a home that may have been around? I mean, that ground, the land you're walking on, is from the beginning of time. I mean, I guess all of the land we walk on is the beginning of time. You know, but there, there were people living there, and there were buildings there. I just, as you can see by my voice and my facial expression, I still haven't gotten over how old things are there. So one of the groups that came in and conquered the people that were there before, and I I bought some books and I've read them several times and I can't remember the order of the various wars, but the Romans conquered Palestine, and uh, Heron, Herod, 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 bad guy. I learned he was a bad guy. <laughs> Herod built Caesarea. This is the amphitheater that holds several thousand people that is still in use today for concerts. So that amphitheater gets used. Uh, that's Ami, our tour guide, who is demonstrating the precursor to the flush toilet. <laughs> I've been told those with high status sit where um, Ami is. That's upstream. <laughs> you don't want to sit downstream. We went to the Mount of Olives. OK, so here's some, just some interesting observations. I'm Jewish. I'm used to Hebrew script. But anytime I see Hebrew script, it's in a religious context. It was really mind-boggling to see freeway signs in Hebrew script. To see church names in Hebrew script, well, of course everything's in Hebrew because that's a national language. What's so odd about that? I didn't realize I would react that way until I saw it. So that's a sign for the Mount of Olives. Most, all signs are in Hebrew. Depending where you are and who the population is, it's probably in Arabic and it may be in English, and then there are other signs. There's a large Russian immigrant population, and so the Russian language may also be there, but everything's in Hebrew. So those trees are the ancient olive trees that were planted from the actual olive trees that were in the, I'm in the garden of Gethsemane? Gethsemane. Gethsemane. Okay, I have, as I told somebody earlier, the Hebrew words I can pronounce. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Gethsemane. I didn't grow up on these stories. I, but those are um, graphs. Off, graphs from the original trees. That is, we stood in the garden where Jesus was the night before his crucifixion, where the arrest took place. Those grave sites you see, if you can see it on the lower right hand corner, they are in the val they are. Um, we're at the Mount of Olives looking down into the valley. Those grave sites are two to 3,000 years old. I mean, like, we're talking old. Really old. Going to Jerusalem, it's a walled city that has been around for thousands of years. And today, 2013, 
70,000 people live within its walls. 70,000 people. It's divided into four quarters, the Jewish quarter, the Muslim quarter, the Christian, and the Armenian. They all are crammed into this ancient city. Um, up here, these are the golden gates where the Messiah was believed would walk through. And so some group that came in that killed everybody before it boarded up the gates so that the Messiah wouldn't be able to get into the old city of Jerusalem. You know, interesting. I mean, like this is what they're living with. I thought this picture, you may or may not be able to see it. So this is a tunnel connecting the different quarters in old Jerusalem are separated by tunnels. We're going through a tunnel from, I forget what area to what area. And I looked down at the end and I couldn't stop laughing. Can anybody read what that sign says? Jerusalem pizza. <laughs> not everybody eats the Mediterranean diet. The other thing you kind of get used to, and Israeli say it brings some comfort, there are armed guards with large rifles everywhere. Everywhere. It's war is a way of life, I guess. And then the western wall, which was the wall around the original temple site, was overwhelming. It, it was, um, it's an area where you put, it, it's very quiet, anybody can go there, there's a sign saying, please be respectful. This is a um, sacred site. And it's very quiet. And people go up to the wall. And no matter what religion you are, you are it, it's a spiritual experience. And you write a prayer on a little piece of paper and you shove it into the cracks. And then they never destroy that paper. When it falls out, they periodically sweep up the pieces of paper. But these are prayers to God. And they sweep up the pieces of paper and they bury them. You know, so it's, um, and they have chairs for people who want to sit. They have prayer books that are available. But there were, uh, the majority of the people were certainly Jewish there. But in our group, we were, of the nine of us, only three of us were Jewish. And everybody was just awe-stricken by being next to this um, magnificent wall. I am here to tell you. At one point, I said to Ami, our tour guide, when am I going to see a synagogue? I'm in Israel. <laughs> Where are the synagogues? Because there's such a rich Christian history in that area that I went to the Holy Church of the Se Sepulcher. Yes, <laughs> thank you. And that's the, um, the three pictures um, to your right. Those were taken in that church, and that's where Jesus was buried and later where the resurrection took place. Do I, do I have my story correct? Yep, and there's also the rock. The, yes. That rock, yeah. There's a rock. Yeah, I get goosebumps thinking. The, the rock where, tell me about the rock again. Where he was laid to rest. And so those in our group who were, it was the predominantly the Catholics in our group, then uh, I guess the tradition is you kiss the rock. And, and so they, uh, my picture didn't turn out well, uh, but of kissing the rock where he was laid um, after his crucifixion. And the um, picture in the upper left-hand corner is the Dome of the Rock at the Temple Mound. That's the original site of the original Jewish synagogue that now has a, a, um, a Muslim mosque on it. And it, it's a beautiful gold dome with magnificent blue um, ceramic um, mosaic, just absolutely beautiful. So there is the, the three monolithic religions all claim Jerusalem as a sacred site. How could we expect peace? You know, at least we as healthcare providers could at least provide healthcare and the health information technology to be able to heal them as they have their various whatevers. One last thing about the geography in the upper right-hand corner, we are at this monument to the 1967 war. So we were in the upper portion here. This is a viewing area that you can go up to. And this is a picture that I took there. We're in an Israeli settlement that you read about in the West Bank. These are the homes in the settlement. We went to dinner at our guide's house. These are the homes. This is the border road road that separates the Israeli settlement from the Palestinian settlement. So when you hear about 
the fighting that takes place between the Israeli settlements and the Palestinian settlements, they are literally a stone's throw away. So this is a Palestinian community, and this is an Israeli community. What I learned was Israeli means Israeli citizen, does not necessarily mean Jewish, because almost 20% of the population is Muslim. And there is the 5% or so that is um, unaffiliated. And that's our group at the Mount of Olives, and behind us is the old city of Jerusalem. So it was a fascinating trip from a geopolitical, cultural, historical, culinary, healthcare, health IT, blah, 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 blah. And thank you very much for giving me the privilege of being able to share my experience with you. So if you have any questions, I'd be more than glad to answer them. Thank you, Willa. Does anybody have any questions about Israeli food, religion, <laughs> health IT? The eggplant and olives are great. <laughs> yes. I actually, um, my husband um, had done some business, and I went about three, four years ago to Israel, and it was Similar. fabulous. Yeah. Absolutely fabulous. So it isn't as scary as people make it out to be. When you're over there, I think a lot of it's hype that you, you're, you feel very safe and secure. Yes, you do have to go through security checks when you go into a regular store or a mall. Just, it's, everyone's just present. Um, yeah, every then, hospital had a, a, a fence around it yeah. with a gated area and security guards with rifles. Yep, yep. But um, it's a beautiful country. It's very similar to Southern California. Uh, it has a very active wine industry now. Um, so, uh, yes, very we did imbibe. <laughs> yeah, so um, just beautiful, beautiful. So we're sort of at the conclusion of today, and I want to help really thank everyone who sort of stuck with us at the end. I want to thank all of our sponsors, um, 